Welcome everyone to this lecture for a theory and intuition behind dbSCAN. dbSCAN stands for Density-Based Spatial Clustering of Applications with Noise. Here we're going to review a brief history of the algorithm and take an intuitive understanding and exploration of how dbSCAN actually works when it's training. Later on in a future lecture, we'll dive a lot deeper into the hyperparameters we can adjust during training. But for right now, let's focus on an intuition. First, a brief history. In 1972, Robert F. Ling published a closely related algorithm in the theory and construction of k-clusters. However, it did have an expected runtime of order n cubed. This means that as n number of points grows, that is the total data points you need to assign clusters to, the runtime of the algorithm would grow cubically. Later on, in 1996, a group of researchers proposed the modern version of dbSCAN, which is what we're going to be using, with a runtime of order n squared. While order n squared still may seem like a lot, when you actually see how the algorithm works, it's pretty impressive that they were able to reduce from a cubic runtime to a squared runtime. And in fact, in 2014, dbSCAN was awarded the Test of Time Award at one of the leading data mining conferences. So, what are the questions we want to consider as we learn about dbSCAN throughout these lectures? We first need to understand how does dbSCAN work? Then, we want to understand the advantages and disadvantages of dbSCAN, and in particular, how does it deal with outliers and noise, since the term noise is actually within the name of dbSCAN. First, there are some key ideas we need to understand. dbSCAN focuses on using density of points as its main factor for assigning cluster labels and this creates the ability to find cluster segmentations that other algorithms have great difficulty with. For example, let's consider the following data set. This is often called a moons data set because we see we have kind of these two crescent moons, one concave and one convex. And typically, if you were to try to do some sort of clustering on this particular data set, many clustering algorithms would have issues with it. So we can clearly see that there's two moon-shaped clusters. However, distance-based clustering methods are going to have issues with this data set. Note how the peaks or ends of the moon are quite close to the center of the other moon, which means if we're thinking about distance, we may not actually end up clustering the two moons. And notice here, these edges of the moons are also quite close together. So if we were to actually run k-means on this and say we were looking for two clusters, it would cluster the points like this. And in fact, you see here the results of using distance-based metrics instead of density-based metrics. So clearly k-means doesn't actually see the two dense moon shapes that we're really, as humans, able to see quite easily. dbSCAN, however, is able to clearly identify with the right hyperparameter choices, the two moons we see here. So what dbSCAN is going to do is it's going to iterate through points and use two key hyperparameters, epsilon and minimum number of points, to assign cluster labels. And we'll talk about these hyperparameters in more detail in a future lecture. But the important thing to note here is unlike k-means, it's focusing on density as the main factor for cluster assignment of points instead of distance from one point to another. So we mentioned these key hyperparameters, and just to briefly touch upon them, epsilon is going to be known as the distance extended from a point, and minimum number of points is the minimum number of points in an epsilon distance. Now let's talk about points first, and we can see how epsilon and minimum number of points actually play into this assignment of point types. There are three main point types to consider when running dbSCAN, and that is a core point, a border point, and an outlier point, which is really interesting because we can already get an intuition that dbSCAN is going to be able to identify outliers for us automatically. Let's consider this unlabeled data set and how dbSCAN would approach it given two hyperparameters, epsilon and minimum number of points, in order to identify clusters and identify key point types. We'll begin with identifying a core point dbSCAN starts off with just randomly choosing a point and then checking what kind of point type it is. So let's first define a core point. And we'll begin by assuming an epsilon of 1. So recall epsilon is that distance extended from the point to begin identifying other points and its relationship to it. 
And then minimum number of points is the minimum number of points within an epsilon neighborhood to identify a point as a core point. So that leads us to the definition of core, which is going to be a point with a minimum number of points in epsilon range. So if we take a look at the diagram on the right, we have our center core point, and we take a look at an epsilon distance around that point in some n-dimensional space, and then we're checking to see how many points are within that epsilon range. And we can see here that if we don't include the core point, there are two points, and if we do include the point, there are three points. And something to clarify is, depending on which version of DB scan you're running, sometimes the point itself is not included in minimum number of points. But almost always, most versions of the algorithm will include the core point as counting towards the minimum number of points. So we can see here we have a core point because within an epsilon distance, we see we do satisfy the minimum number of points, which we could set as two. But even if minimum points was three, for example, it would typically, for virtually most versions of DB scan, it would include itself. So this would actually still satisfy as a core point. So just to clarify here, for most versions of dbscan, including the one we will be using, minimum number of points does include the point itself that you're looking at. So here, we're gonna identify this as a core point because if we take a look at an epsilon distance surrounding this point, I can see that there are three points within this epsilon's distance, two and then the point itself, meaning this point is now a core point. So let's continue on by understanding a border point. A border point is going to be in an epsilon range of a core point, but it does not contain a minimum number of points. For example, I can see here, this is a core point with epsilon equal to one and minimum points is equal to three. In fact, I can see here that there are four points, including the core point itself, within an epsilon distance. But if I continue on to check out this point, this is a border point because it is within the epsilon range of a core point that was this one previously, but within its own range, it actually doesn't contain the minimum number of points. This one only has two, and we set the minimum number of points now to be equal to three. Keep in mind that epsilon and minimum points has to be set before you actually run DB scan for training. It's not something that is typically adjusted during training. So this is a border point. Again, to clarify, we have our core point where we see here that it's satisfying the minimum number of points, that is three, within an epsilon distance. It has four points, including itself. But for this point, it's within the epsilon range of a core point, but it itself did not contain the minimum number of points in order to satisfy as a core point. So this is essentially telling you that this particular point is going to be on the border of a cluster. So to put them together, we can see the core point, which is going to be a core point of the cluster assignment, and then the border point, which is within the epsilon range of a core point, but it itself does not have the minimum number of points. And we can see how density is starting to play in as a factor here. We're looking to see which points are kind of closely packed together, and then we eventually identify these border points to more or less seal off the cluster. And then finally, the outlier cannot be reached, so to speak, by points in a cluster assignment. So as dbscan is iterating through the points, it's gonna be assigning things like core, border, or outlier. And we can see here that core and border are within the same epsilon range of each other. So they'll actually end up being assigned to the same cluster. But then what happens as you keep iterating through points, you're eventually going to select one that can't really be reached by points in a already cluster assignment, such as a core point or even a border point, which means dbscan is gonna say this is noise or an outlier, and it's too far away from anything else to really be part of a cluster, meaning dbscan is automatically identifying outliers for you. So we're gonna be discussing things like neighborhoods, epsilon, minimum number of points in further detail later on. But what we wanna do now is review the actual process of dbscan for assigning clusters now that we understand point types. The dbscan procedure is actually pretty simple. First, we're gonna pick a random point that has not yet been assigned a cluster label or point type. Then we need to determine the point type given the conditions we just talked about, whether it's a core, border, or outlier. And then once a core point has been found, we're gonna add all directly reachable points, that is any continuous core points or border points to the same cluster as that particular core point that we just identified. 
and we're going to repeat this process until all the points have been assigned to a cluster label or as an outlier. So just to be clear here, while there are two main point types of a cluster, that is a core point and a border point, that doesn't mean they belong to two separate clusters. It just means they're two different point types belonging to the same cluster. Probably the best way to fully understand this is to explore a really useful online visualization of the procedure on a data set. And what's nice about this online visualization is you can actually play around with the values of epsilon and minimum number of points to see how it affects the actual training of the algorithm. Let's hop over to that visualization now and explore it further. Okay, here we have the online visualization tool that is linked as a resource to this lecture. Keep in mind, we do not actually run this website. It's just a useful tool that's online. And you'll notice the data set we chose was the smiley face data set. So what we have here are a series of points that are in the shape of a smiley face. Notice they're just kind of black line circles with white inside because they have not been assigned a cluster yet. Then we have the two eyes and essentially a smiley face. So what are these red dots on top of this? These are kind of the theoretical random starting positions and what they would be affected by in terms of epsilon and minimum number of points. So we can see here, as you increase epsilon, you're increasing the size of the range you're gonna look for to satisfy a minimum number of points. Essentially saying that if you make epsilon really large, you're really likely to put things into the same cluster, which makes sense because now you're looking at a really large space around any core point. Or if you make epsilon super small, you may end up with many more different unique clusters because you're not looking too far away from any particular core point to add it to the same cluster. We'll start off with epsilon equal to about one. Now, minimum number of points is what's deciding whether or not these circles are filled in with red or not, or if they're just empty. And essentially what that is saying is, does this particular center satisfy the minimum number of points requirement? You'll notice that some of these points are not even on top of any point itself. This is kind of just a random starting grid. So it's not really how dbscan is gonna start. It's gonna start by choosing a random point. It doesn't really start with this grid. This is just a visualization tool. We can see here that if you were to decrease the minimum number of points, suddenly some of these epsilon ranges are gonna be filled in because now they're actually satisfying that minimum number of points requirement. But if you make minimum number of points really large, then you'll notice less of those ranges are gonna satisfy the minimum number of points. And that would be even more affected as we kind of change the epsilon itself. Just to see this visualization though, let's go ahead and start off with minimum number of points equal to three and an epsilon of one. And this will allow us to see how the actual process works. Now what's really cool about this visualization tool is we can actually adjust epsilon and minimum number of points during the training. Keep in mind, this is not actually what happens during real training. You wouldn't be playing around epsilon and minimum number of points unless you had some super advanced or complex data set where you happen to be tweaking hyperparameters during training. That's an extremely unusual case and it wouldn't be part of scikit-learn's capabilities. So we're gonna hit go here. You'll notice it chose a random starting point and now it's finding those core points and continuing along as it finds more border points. And as the core and border points are found, and in particular, these are probably all core points for right now, then it's gonna add them to the same cluster. This is allowing it to identify this unique circle shape. And we're actually going to code out some visualizations that allow us to identify circles within other circles. So this is the density based algorithm actually finding this kind of unique shape. And even though this eye right here is quite close to this outer ring, it's not identifying it as part of the same cluster. So now this is finished. It chose another random point and it's quickly finding these density based points. So dbscan is able to quickly find the smiley face structure and assign four unique clusters, this outer ring, the two eyes and the smiley face. Keep in mind, many other algorithms will have a lot of trouble with this data set and they would probably assign this eye to the same cluster as this outer ring set of points, as well as this eye assigned to the same cluster as this outer ring over here. And that's because of the distance between the eye to the outer ring, not taking into account density. I would encourage you to visit this online resource that's linked to you in the resources, and then you could play around with the different epsilon and minimum number of points, and you can even play around with it during training. So if we hit restart here and choose smiley face again, 
and I hit go, I can see the circle for epsilon, but if I increase epsilon during training, you'll notice that circle starts to get a lot larger, and if I were to decrease minimum number of points, now it's very likely that things are going to be assigned to the same cluster if they come into contact. For example, we can see this I almost made into contact with the epsilon range, but for this particular case, it's very likely that we'll get the same results as it continues, just because of the distance between these points and the outer ring. But you can see now that the zone that it was considering is a lot thicker or a lot wider now than it was before, versus last time, it was a lot more narrow which means you could take a look at a noisier version of this data set and see how epsilon and minimum number of points end up affecting it. So for example, if we hit restart here, there is what they call the pimpled smiley, which is essentially a smiley face, but it has way more outliers. So this is where you would really want to experiment with epsilon and minimum number of points. So note here that now if I suddenly increase epsilon and decrease minimum number of points, you're gonna see that some of these outlier points that are kind of near the outer edge of the circle, but maybe probably not part of the outer edge, who should be identified as outliers, are gonna be identified as part of the cluster. Notice these two points would probably be identified as outliers usually, but since I made epsilon so large, they're getting dragged in to the same cluster as this outer circle. And notice now, it's actually starting to pick up on the eyes as part of the outer circle instead of this own particular cluster. So we could, if we really wanted to, suddenly minimize epsilon to some very short range and then continue, whoops, let me make it a tiny bit larger so it doesn't take forever. And you see if you make epsilon tiny and minimum number of points tiny, suddenly you get a bunch of unique clusters instead of getting everything as a smiley face. So we're gonna be experimenting with this since these are pretty much the two key hyperparameters during the usage of dbscan that we have to consider. And that is epsilon and minimum number of points. This is a great tool for you to get an intuitive understanding about that. And later on, we're actually gonna show you how you can code out and see diagrams and things like inflection points to choose the right epsilon and minimum number of points for your data set. Okay, before we do all that though, let's go ahead and code a little bit just so we can get an understanding of how dbscan works within scikit-learn and Python. I'll see you there.